In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we command you, brothers and sisters, to keep away from every believer who is idle and disruptive and does not live according to the teaching you received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example. We were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's food without paying for it. On the contrary, we worked night and day, labouring and toiling, so that we would not be a burden to any of you. We did this not because we do not have the right to such help, but in order to offer ourselves as a model for you to imitate. For even when we were with you, we gave you this rule, the one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. We hear that some of you are idle and disruptive. They are not busy, they are busybodies. Such people we command and urge in the Lord Jesus Christ to settle down and earn the food they eat. And as for you, brothers and sisters, never tire of doing what is good. Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer or ruler. Yet it stores its provisions in summer and gathers its food at harvest. How long will you lie there, you sluggard? When will you get up from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. And poverty will come on you like a thief, and scarcity like an armed man. I went past the field of a sluggard, past the vineyard of someone who has no sense. Thorns had come up everywhere. The ground was covered with weeds, and the stone wall was in ruins. I applied my heart to what I observed, and I learned a lesson from what I saw. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come on you like a thief, and scarcity like an armed man. Good morning, friends. My name is Rob, one of the pastors here. So good to be gathered with you today as we think about the place of work in our lives. And uh, I wonder if I was to ask first up, what would your dream job be? What would you say? Everyone's thinking. Surely, for me, it's being a a chocolate taste tester. (laughs) Working for Cadbury's. I'll, I'll taste that one. Thank you. I'll taste that one. What about your worst job? What would your worst job, the last job you'd want to do, be? Some people in the village service said, cleaning. Don't want to clean. Okay. Surely something like sewage or something like that. For me, I'm a sweater. So anything working in hot spaces, ah, I don't want to do it. Like I couldn't work in Dubai. Couldn't be regular. Sorry, Ray. I've had many jobs in my limited career from a coffee machine technician to a barista to Bricky's laborer, to working in offices, and then became a fitness trainer, and now in ministry. But so much of our life revolves around work, doesn't it? There are 168 hours in a week, and let's say around eight of those each day is about, is kind of sleep time. Some of you less, some of you refuse to sleep, some of you more. And so that's about 56 hours of sleep time. Now, the average amount of hours worked in Australia is about 29 to 30 hours. Now, in the world, Australia are the lowest amount of hours average worked in the week. Isn't that interesting? In the world. What a lazy bunch of people we are. (laughs) Now, I know many of you do many more than that, and some of you less. And I think even that we're lowest probably says we get paid pretty well in this country. But that leaves about 80 hours left over Divide that by seven days, about 10 to 12 hours of the day to do other stuff, which is usually taken up by other work that we need to do. Things like brushing your teeth, brushing your hair, making the bed, showering, cleaning the room, cleaning the lounge room, cleaning the kitchen, cleaning the table, preparing breakfast or lunch or dinner, or if you've got kids or a spouse, 
helping them get ready for the day and whatever else is going on and, and gardening and mowing and responding to the family WhatsApp group messages. Wow, they just keep coming and coming and coming and taking the rubbish out, checking the mail, sorting the mail, folding clothes or ironing clothes, putting them away if you manage to wash them in the morning as you got up, fixing the broken tap, the broken cupboard, or taping back together uh, ripped pages from kids' books. I don't know if anybody else does that. Talking on the phone with that friend or family member who's just going through a hard time, that's a work. And after all that, if you've got maybe an hour, you can squeeze in some TV or scrolling through a little bit of social media or just stopping to stare at the wall for a minute to remember that it's okay or pottering around in the garage or you know, let alone try to pray or read the Bible or listen to a sermon or, or you just some of us try to squeeze in a few more work hours of the day instead of sleep. Life is full of work, right? And it can be hard work. And then people have the audacity to ask us what our hobbies are. Like, hobbies? Just making it to the next day, that's a hobby for me. Why is it that so much of life seems to revolve around work? Well, at one level, living takes money, right? So we need to work to live. But on another level, a far deeper level, we were created to work. We were created to work. It's in our DNA. Have a listen to Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 to 28. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it, rule over the fish in the sea and the birds of the sky and over every living creature that moves along the ground. And you thought your role description was pretty big. Humans were created and commissioned to rule over and care for all of creation, essentially to help its existence. It's in our nature to be workers, to be busy nurturing and creating and fashioning and brainstorming and troubleshooting, helping others to live and flourish. That's why we were made. It's how we express our image of God to the world. It's how we love creation and how we glorify God. I wonder if you were to think through what's an area of some kind of work that someone does that you really appreciate, what would it be? Something that Someone out there has a skill to do, some kind of work they do that you really just love. Maybe the person who fashioned the chairs that you're sitting on. For me, it's the person who invented hot chips. I mean, that guy, girl, whoever it was, genius. Or the, the company of people involved in putting together our car. Or our mechanics who service them. Or you know, people who design clothes so we can wear them. And, or audio sound people who enabled this to, that you can hear it out there. Book writers. Printers. The person who made the printing press. Government, politics, police, roads and traffic officials helping us to keep moving on the road. Even Centrelink and job find kind of uh, organizations. When I started fixing coffee machines, that came out of a job find a company who just said, here's a random job for you, and I, and I took it, and I appreciated that. The person who invented wet wipes, <laughs> disposable nappies, schools serving communities of people so they can be educated together, builders, engineers, garbos, gardeners, all these and more go into helping us flourish. You see, loving others was, by working was built into our DNA. It's good for us, it's good for others, it's good for our world, and it glorifies God. But from the very beginning, that work was frustrated. Frustrated. Listen to Genesis 3, just a couple of pages on from the beginning. To Adam he said, Because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you. You will eat the plants of the field. 
By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. No matter what we do, our work will never ultimately fulfill us, or the world. It will always frustrate. It will always fail God. And we all kind of know this experience, right? Any gardeners in the room? Those weeds just keep coming back, don't they? Materials corrode, they rot, they rust. Ideas become obsolete. Even when I was fixing coffee machines, the one thing that we could always be sure of was that they they were going to break down again. We serve and love people knowing that they're going to fail us at some point or we're going to fail them. And death ultimately has the last say over any success that we thought we were making in our jobs. We're unable to rule or care for this world as it needs. Our work is marred, it's cursed, it's frustrated, it's hard. And not only has our work been frustrated, but some people intentionally work towards bad ends. Think of people who steal. It takes work to steal something. People who destroy other people's work. Think of fraudsters and hackers and scammers and dodgy businesses human traffickers, pornography producers, all that stuff takes work, but that's not a work that loves others. It's not a work that glorifies God. It's a work fueled by sin. I wonder for you, as you think about your work, whether paid or unpaid, do you know what your work contributes to in the world? Do you know what effect, however big or small, it has on communities, on on this community and wider? Work in this world, which was to be an expression of love, has been frustrated to be a toilsome labor, a troubled necessity. But in God's grace, through Jesus' work, we have been recreated for good works. Jesus has repackaged and repurposed us for good works. You know, when Jesus came to earth, he came to earth to work to love others, to glorify God. He he worked a normal job as a young man, and then he did work that no other human was able to do. He healed incurable diseases. He told a thunderstorm to shut up and calm down. He he raised people back to life from the dead. He, He loved the messy people around them by walking with them, spending time with them, teaching them, praying for them. But even more than that, He destroyed sin on the cross by offering his own perfect life in our place. And then not only did he destroy sin, but he conquered death by rising again from the dead. He did the greatest work this world has ever seen. Think of things like the Egyptian pyramids. Incredible, right? Incredible. Got nothing on Jesus. Think of other things like the Burj Khalifa in Dubai. Amazing. Got nothing on Jesus. Think of things like our mobile phones, smartphones, the world at our fingertips. Got nothing on Jesus. The pyramids are crumbling. It won't be long before somebody builds a bigger building. And it's, not, it's only around the corner that another iPhone's waiting for the new model to come out. But when Jesus had conquered sin and death on the cross, when he'd completed all his work, do you remember what he said? It is finished. It is done. No more work needed. The heaven's doors are open. Access is granted. And people are able to be now renewed, repurposed, redefined. And God is glorified. Listen to how Jesus' work transforms our work in Ephesians chapter 2. Listen to this. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. See, all that we do now as Christians is in response to Jesus' work for us, and it changes the purpose of why we do any work. We see it again in Paul's letter to Titus in chapter 3. This is what it says. 
After explaining the gospel, how we got saved, he says, this is a trustworthy saying, and I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. It literally reads by to good work. These are excellent and profitable for everyone. And again, at the end of the letter, he says this, our people must learn to devote themselves to doing what is good. Again, good work work in order to provide for urgent needs and not live unproductive lives. Good works done in response to the gospel. Good works that benefit other people. In other words, just as Mike put it up here, love. Love. The Christian life is not merely toilsome labor, but a labor of love for our world. Listen to Paul, when he prays for the Christians in Thessalonica, listen to what he prays for them. He says, we always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. We remember before God, before our God and Father, your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Sorry, I'm just clipping my thingy, my sound thing on the back of my shirt. Ah, Got it. You see, that is an all-encompassing faith that rolls itself out in good work for the sake of loving the world to the glory of God. And not just to serve them practically, physically, but true love for this world longs for people to know why we love them. Because of how much we've been loved by our Lord. Just as he says in Colossians 3, 17, and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, whatever it is that you find yourself doing, whether you're getting paid for it or not, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Whether you're creating, cleaning, packing, selling, thinking, solving, operating, changing nappies, speaking to someone, listening to someone, disposing of something, Whatever it else that you lay before in your week, all our work should contribute to sharing God's love with this world. And you know what? We need saved people in all different areas in this world. Wherever you, it is that you find yourself working through the week, you are particularly made by God and skilled in some area to have opportunities that I will never have. You'll meet people that I'll never meet you'll interact with people that the ministry and team here will never get to speak to. And God has particularly placed you there to be able to minister to them and love them in that way. Now, at this point, you might be thinking, hey, hang on a sec, I thought this was a talk on Proverbs. Um, Are we going to get there sometime? Yes, you're right. But see, first we need to understand, in Jesus we see why we work, but Proverbs goes on to help us understand how we do that work. See, Proverbs is God's wisdom for us to live in his world in line with a pattern of why he's made things to work and how. It's not going to tell us what job to get. It's not going to tell you when to go for that promotion. It's not going to tell you how to balance or make your calendar for your work-life balance, rest, and things like that. But it will help you think wisely and be godly in whatever work or labor you find yourself in. Now, I could stand up here today and pretty much apply the whole book of Proverbs to our working life. Like, I could just read through the book and we all go home. I won't do that. But I think there's three big areas that Proverbs particularly speaks into when it comes to helping us work wisely. And remember, I'm not just talking about paid work here, but any labor we find ourselves doing for others in order to help their existence in this world. So, first off, God's wisdom says, work not lazily, but faithfully. Not lazily, but faithfully. It's amazing how much Proverbs has to say about laziness. Heaps. And I think it's because it really goes against the nature of why we were created. Have a listen to Proverbs 10.4. Lazy hands make for poverty, but diligent hands bring wealth. That's kind of basic truth about how the world works. Proverbs 26, 13 to 16 speaks of the sluggard. The sluggard is another name for a lazy person. The sluggard says, there's a lion in the, in, the, in the road, a fierce lion roaming in the streets. 
As a door turns on its hinges, so a sluggard turns on his bed. A sluggard buries his hand in the dish. He is too lazy to bring it back to his mouth. A sluggard is wiser in his own eyes than seven people who answer discreetly. The idea is there's always an excuse for the person who's lazy. Proverbs 18.9 speaks of them in this way. One who is slack in his work is brother to one who destroys. Proverbs wants to say to the sluggard, Proverbs 6, 6 to 11, go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer or ruler, yet it stores its provisions in summer and gathers its food at harvest. How long will you lie there, you sluggard? When will you get up from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. And poverty will come on you like a thief and scarcity like an armed man. Now, in these days, they didn't have things like superannuation and Centrelink and the pension. But they did have laws in God's law that were there to protect poor people and people who weren't able to work. But now, and of course, this is, I know there are gen genuine, legitimate reasons for people who are unable to work, either health reasons or mental health reasons. Even my own wife has a, a chronic illness that doesn't allow her to work a full-time job. I get that. And he's not saying that you've got to be working 24-7, otherwise you're a lazy person. Even God rested from his work, and he told us to rest as well. This is talking about the person who could, but willfully refuses to do the work needed to bless other people. They refuse to love. Proverbs says, don't be lazy, but be faithful. Be a faithful worker. Listen to Proverbs 25, 13. This is just a beautiful picture. Like a snow-cooled drink at harvest time is a trustworthy messenger to the one who sends him. He refreshes the spirit of his master. Isn't that a great picture? Like having a nice cold drink on a hot day is a worker who is faithful, who works hard, who does what they need to, who does the job. My old boss uh, in coffee machines was stolen from and lied to by a guy who called himself a Christian. And when I started working there, I had a lot of work to do to convince, try to convince him that God was worth trusting. He was completely turned off God. The way we work has the power to show people what God is like. Listen to how the New Testament calls the Christian to do their work. This is in Colossians 3, 22 to 24. Slaves, or we might say workers, Obey your earthly masters in everything and do it, not only when their eye is on you and to curry their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. I wonder, does that passage describe you would you say that you're more, maybe just go back to the verse before, would you say you're more verse 22? Just, yeah. Or are you more verse 23? The next one. Do you, do you just do what you have to do? Someone's watching? Or do you work as if God, your Father in heaven, is pleased with you? Second thing to note in Proverbs is that in, Proverbs encourages us to work skillfully, but without that defining our identity. Work skillfully without it defining our identity. Listen to Proverbs 22, 29. Do you see someone skilled in their work? They will serve before kings. They will not serve before officials of low rank. This is kind of another general truth that we see in the world. I think it's Obvious for us too, we love watching things like elite sports people do what they do best, or musicians in concerts just really excelling in their skill, or, or a skilled chef. You know, you go to uh, teppanyaki and you watch the chef throwing food at you, or watching Master Chef. But often the difference between them and us is only that they have worked a billion times over more than we have to get as skilled as they are. But 
Doing our work skillfully isn't just to impress people or make it on a TV show, but it loves people more than a half-hearted job does. I think we've all had this experience, right? <laughs> That's not love, right? <laughs> The burger comes out, the pieces are all over the place. Sometimes they miss the meat altogether. It's crazy. That's not love. The guy in the back there was not loving people. But on the other side, I think many of us have also felt this. Yeah, oh, how love do you feel when that turns up? Oh, thank you. Thank you. The difference between how loved you feel with each of those is worlds apart. And I wonder, does your work show others that you love them? Would people say they feel loved? by what you do, the way you do it. I think our work as well, our skilled work, also reflects our nature in who God has made us, that we're like God, God the great skilled worker who made all things well. You think about the way the world works, the way the universe works, from the greatest mountains to the most minuscule creature, God is skilled and beautiful in his work, and we get that privilege to be like him. Now, if you need more skills in your work, find help. Proverbs says, the fool doesn't ask for help or doesn't listen to advice, but wise people surround themselves with people who will help them grow and learn. Do you need a mentor to grow in your work? Have you done all that you can to be as good as you can be at what you do? But be careful, because it's very easy to tie up what we do with who we are especially if you're good at what you do. You know, it's often the first question we ask people when we meet them, right? What do you do? What do you do for yourself? What do you do for a living? As if what they do is going to tell us who they are. You see, when our identity is caught up with what we do, our work has the power to bring us deep joy, but also real pain depending on how successful or how much like a failure we feel that we are. You ask any parent of toddlers or teenagers if they feel successful in their work, and the answer will always be no. Yet, if, if you are successful, if you say yes, I'd like to speak to you at the end of the service. <laughs> but you ask a flourishing entrepreneur who's built a business from the ground up, and they'll feel secure, even proud of their achievements. But that's not what brings us peace or confidence before God. See, before God, our achievements add nothing to our salvation or our standing with God. And on the other side, nor do our failures affect how much our Heavenly Father loves us. Our status is secure only in our union with Christ. Those who find their identity in their work, often they don't know when to stop, they work long hours and there's always more to do. Their emotional state is highly affected by whether they're doing well at work or not. They often forget why they work. It's not about making money to support family or church or life. It's not about loving people anymore. It's got nothing to do with God or his glory. It's more about how it reflects them and their glory. So when our identity is caught up in our work, we struggle to know how to be ourselves at home or on holidays, if you ever take them. And when you retire, you particularly struggle because you've long forgotten who you are before God and why you exist, that you were made for God, and that your work, which you no longer do, was for God and others and not about you. And I think that's the particular struggle of our secular world as well. Work is all they have. It's what defines them. It's why greed and power dominate businesses, why comparison and envy infiltrate workspaces, why depression and anxiety often cloud young minds because the world has told them unless they're doing their dream job, they haven't found their destiny. Unless their work fulfills them, they're empty. Proverbs 4.23 warns us, above all else, guard your heart. Don't buy that lie. Buy the truth. That's what Proverbs 23, 23 tells us. Buy the truth and do not sell it. Wisdom, instruction, and insight as well. Build our life on the truth of who God says we are, not what our world tells us. You are not defined by your work. 
You are not what you do. You are who God says that you are, a loved, accepted child of the Most High God who has made you in a particular way and given you particular skills and abilities to be able to bless this world and bring glory to God. Amen? That's your identity. Josh Vincent and I uh, recently, Josh invited me to a, uh, an event for coffee roasters to go along and find out about decaffeinated coffee that's happening around the world and different coffee roasting things. And uh, there were people there who had big roasting businesses and some who just starting out. But as we were talking to people, uh, none of them Christian, it, it, it became so clear to me that each one of them were lacking a sense of peace. I could feel the difference between Josh and I and how, how we were just relating to each other and, and the difference between others as even the way they were looking around the room, the way they were talking with us and each other, there was, there was an inner sense of struggle and striving that I could feel. And it was just, it hit me and was a real reminder and encouragement of the difference that relating with Christians has and that where identity is stored in God, there's a sense of peace as we speak to one another. The striving is put aside. You can feel it in the air. The difference between speaking with those people and a Christian brother or sister, you could feel it. And I wonder if, if actually you've come to appreciate that if you've, as you speak to each other and gather together in smaller groups. The people in your life that you work with who don't know that peace, I reckon they've felt it with you. The peace you have. I remember working as a personal trainer. One day I was walking up the stairs with another guy. I've told you the story before. But he stopped me on the stairs and he said, there's something different about you. I can't work out what it is. And I said, I just went for it. I said, no, you know what? It's Jesus and you need him too. And he said, no, 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 that's not it. <laughs> it's, um, <laughs> he says, but I'll work it out. Inner peace. What a great gift from God, hey? When we, we know who we are before him, the freedom that comes with that is just, ah. And that leads us into our last point, which is that Proverbs encourages us to work with others and with God always in mind. Listen to Proverbs 19, 17. Whoever is kind to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will reward them for what they have done. He's watching everything that happens. Ephesians 4.28 encourages us to work so that we're not a burden on others, but actually have something to share with other people. I'm always so encouraged each time I go into the kitchen here at church, as I look into the freezer and I see the amount of frozen meals are, that are in there by people who have spent their money and their time through the week cooking meals for others who are in need. And if that's you, bless you. You are blessed. Proverbs 3.27 says, Do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it is in your power to act. Is there a work in your life that you need to come through on? Something you've been holding back on? Something that's left lingering? You can rinse the dishes before they go into the dishwasher. You can do it. <laughs> Proverbs 3, 3 to 6 says this, Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. Notice what's important there. Not the task of your work, but the relationships that the task affects. All we do for others is intricately connected with our relationship with God. How we love others is how we love God, and how we love God affects how we love others. Therefore, the writer will say in the very next two verses, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your paths straight. Is your labor, your work at the moment stressing you in some way? Commit it to God. Are you wondering what job path to choose? Pray. Are you wondering whether you should take that promotion? Pray, wondering if you should quit your work and take up ministry or go overseas on mission. Pray, and then do it. There's one last one for the bosses among us here. This is Colossians 4.1. It says, Masters, 
provide your slaves with what is right and fair, because you know that you also have a master in heaven. Any bosses among us? This is for you. There's a girl from our evening service who thought that all Christians were bigots and non-thinkers, and she called herself an atheist at the time, and she didn't want to have anything to do with Christians. She hated them. And she started working as a fitness trainer, and as she went through a rough patch, she experienced the genuine love of God through her bosses as they showed her and guided her and spoke truth into her life, who God is, and that made her ask questions, and she's become a Christian. And they're actually getting married this year to another Christian guy and just loves God. If you're a boss, understand the power you have to show God's goodness to your workers. And finally, let's hear it again, Colossians 3.17. Maybe we could read this together. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for you are our great worker. All things come from you. You've made all things beautiful and skillful through your son. We thank you for the work that he's done on our behalf on the cross. We thank you for the work that you continue to do by your spirit in our hearts. We ask, Lord, as we see our place in this world, that you would show us how to work for your glory. Fill us with all that we need to do our work well, to love others well, that we might be people who show your love to others, skillfully, faithfully, not finding our identity there, but knowing who we are before you. And Lord, transform that work that our world would see it clearly. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.